Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for protecting all of us during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at Family Caregiver Alliance and your co-host. Protecting all of us during the COVID pandemic and beyond is part of a series of webinars focusing on caregiving during the COVID-19 coronavirus emergency. These webinars are a collaboration between Family Caregiver Alliance and the San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services. We will have a brief hiatus next week and then starting the week after, the webinar will be on palliative care and COVID-19. And the week following that will be on COVID-19 and advanced care planning. Webinars are every Thursday, except for now, um, next Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. Now, if you haven't heard about Family Caregiver Alliance, briefly, we do research and advocacy for caregivers as well as support services. We have a number of fact sheets, webinars, blog articles, and online classes for caregivers. We offer direct services and counseling in five counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, before I turn things over to our co-presenter, I'd just like to mention we will be doing Q&A at the end of the webinar and a link to a recording of the webinar along the Today's slides will be emailed to everyone who's registered in about one week. Now I'd like to turn things over to today's co-presenter, Luciana Tsai, at the San Francisco Department of Human Services and specifically the Department of Disability and Aging Services. Our first speaker is um, Jessica Lehman. She is part of SDA. She's previously worked as a community organizer at ACORN and uh, then an independent living center where she founded Disability Action Network, which is a grassroots of people with disabilities, building a voice for their community. Um, as a person with a disability who employs home attendance, Jessica supports domestic worker rights and is a founding member and leader of HAND, which is the Domestic Employers Association. She also leads a monthly organizers forum calls as part of the National Disability Leadership Alliance, which helps share ideas and experiences to organizing the disability community. Our second presenter is Nikki Brown Booker, who is a longtime attendant employer, a leader with Hand in Hand and the Domestic Employer Network and Disability Inclusion so now that you know a little bit more about our two speakers, I'd like to turn things over to Nikki. Thank you, Calvin. Um, so I'm Nikki Brown Booker and I co-chair the Hand in Hand Steering Committee. Uh, I am a longtime attendant employer. I currently employ um, six home care workers. Um, and let you know a little bit about Hand in Hand is a national network of employers of nannies, house cleaners, and home attendants. Um, we believe that it benefits everyone when home workplaces are just fair and kind workplaces. We know that in the domestic work sector, the relationships we form with workers in our homes is one of deep interdependence. Um, we need each other. Um, and we all understand right now, this is a difficult time for all of us. And it's something is, it is particularly difficult for people with disabilities and seniors who employ home attendants, uh, caregivers. And it's our hope that this webinar will help us think together how we as employers can work together with our caregivers, attendants to keep everyone safe and healthy as we get through um, this coronavirus epidemic. So our goals for today's conversation are to offer guidance and specific actions to take to, take to stay safe and protect um, our employees and yourself during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and and uh, provide information on rights and responsibilities of employing a home attendant caregiver um, and offer guidance on how to develop a positive and productive relationship and effective communication with a worker. 
um, and identify some policy demands and actions we can take at local and state levels to support, support home care employers and workers. And um, Jessica, did you wanna add something um, onto our goals? Thank you, Nikki. Um, this is Jessica Lehman with Senior and Disability Action. We're a nonprofit um, based in San Francisco that educates and organizes seniors and people with disabilities to fight for change on housing, health care, home care, all different kinds of issues. Um, so it's wonderful to have so many people here today. Before we go on, I wanted to ask if people would introduce themselves in the chat. Um, if you could say your name, unless it appears already, if you're part of an organization or connected with an organization. Um, and this is a training that we developed that is geared towards seniors and people with disabilities who hire attendants. Um, but um, today, of course, it's geared more towards family caregivers and it's, and it's much broader. And so we'd love to hear, are you a family caregiver? Do you um, hire people? Kind of what's your connection to this work? So if you can go ahead and put that in the chat um, as we go on, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, and when you um, put something in the chat, uh, make sure you click to all panelists and attendees so that everyone could see um, who, you, uh, who you are. Um, so I'm going to, um, uh, uh, Kelly, you can change the slide. And um, I'm going to talk around a little bit, give you a little bit of background on domestic work. Um, so we think it's important to ground our con conversations about domestic employment relationships and some like basic history of domestic workers. Um, when federal labor protections were first established in the 1930s, domestic workers and farm workers were actually left out of the protections, largely to maintain a power structure there of the white ownership class that was dependent on um, former slaves who did this work. Um, today, we live with this legacy, which often is done by immigrant women and women of color, um, and they continue to be underpaid, underprotected, and unrecognized uh, relative to other professions. The lack of labor protections for workers and lack of clear guidance for employers paired with multiple oppressions that exacerbate the power imbalance between worker and employer leads to a range of employment practices in this industry from very positive to um, uh, brutal exploitation. So this said, we recognize the dynamics in a home care relationship were often different from others or other domestic work uh, relationships, namely nannies and house cleaners. Um, and because the power because the power imbalance isn't always as lopsided, um, many seniors and people with disabilities who receive home care are also low income, uh, people of color, immigrants, and due to their age or disability, are vulnerable to abuse by others, including by their uh, caregivers. So, in general, home care employers have more in common with their employees than any other kind of domestic employers. Um, facing attacks from the administration, facing discrimination uh, based, on, um, based on class, race, age, uh, or ability, which gives us more reasons to work together and ally both within our homes as well as within the political sphere. So we'll touch a briefly about this towards the end uh, for ways you to uh, partnership um, with other opportunities. So I'm going to turn this over to Jessica now. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please, Kelvin? So we're going to start um, this next piece by talking about some of the challenges that are facing us during this coronavirus pandemic. Um, and these are challenges for seniors and people with disabilities and family members who hire workers or who, um, who are caring for a family member as well as for, um, for paid and unpaid workers. So the first is in, during the shelter in place that so many attendants or caregivers um, can't come to work or don't feel safe coming, that they don't want to be outside, they don't want to be um, exposed to other people, they may have um, family members or people in their household who are particularly at risk, 
they may be working for other people who are particularly at risk um, and they don't want to risk exposing them. Particularly people who need to take public transportation um, either won't be able to do that as public transportation is now limited or will have to be around people and be exposed to the virus um, and risk carrying that to, to family members or to people that they work for. So, um, so then I wrote self-isolating is really from the point of view of the person who, who needs support. Um, and so reducing risk of exposure means having fewer people coming in, right? So um, I am in a wheelchair and I generally hire attendants. I usually have four to five different people at a time who come in a few different shifts a week. Um, and right now I have my partner who, um, you know, I'm very fortunate that he is able to fill in as my attendant. And when we're both working outside the home, that doesn't work and that's not part of how we have set up our relationship. But right now, that's what makes the most sense um, to keep both of us safe and particularly because I am at additional risk of serious illness and death. We've done that um, so that I don't have to have people coming in from outside who may be exposed to the virus. Um, so just trying to figure out for people how to do that, maybe how to have one or two people coming in to provide care instead of five or six um, or whatever number it is, um, is, is complicated. And then for the people who aren't coming in, how do we make sure that we can still pay them or that they are getting paid or that they are able to survive if they're not coming to work? So those are some of the big issues. And then protective equipment as well, right? That we want to be sure we are using masks and gloves, um, particularly with this kind of work, we're in very close contact. Um, and so to be able to have that protective equipment and getting masks and gloves is sometimes challenging. You know, now I'm glad people are being more creative. A lot of people are making masks, um, but it doesn't mean that everyone has them when they need them. Um, and if anyone, I want to thank people who put all your notes in the, the chat. This is extremely helpful um, to get a sense of, of kind of where we are. And um, in fact, uh, I see someone who just shared. Oh, good. Gloria shared it with everyone. So, um, so I assume that means you're okay publicizing it. And she says, I'm the sole caregiver for my husband who has dementia with um, Parkinson's symptoms. And since sheltering in, I haven't felt safe having caregivers in the house. I want to know how to safely have people come in to help. Um, and I just want to acknowledge these are, are very, very real issues, right, of balancing the safety of exposure to the virus with safety of making sure people get the care and support they need and of family caregivers getting the, the support that you need um, so that you are not overtapped in this time um, where there is so much stress on all of us. This is such a new period that for us to be gentle with ourselves and not try to not try to take on everything but to do the best we can to keep ourselves and the people that we care for safe. So um, the next slide, I'm going to go ahead and share some of our recommendations. Um, and again, kind of with the, the caveat that there is no perfect way to do this. And we at SDA and Hand in Hand certainly haven't figured everything out. But we, we have thought and talked a lot about this. And so here are some of our ideas. So to start with general precautions, um, of course, we have all been hearing for months now about washing our hands um, for, with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and not touching our face. Um, we added, um, you know, try not to touch the face or the hands because in this kind of work, that's often challenging. But if you are lifting someone, you may be able to think about where people's hands go or how close people's faces are to each other. Um, wiping down everything at the beginning and the end of the shift. And this is something that Nikki shared. Um, she has been doing with her attendants is the second and a new attendant comes in for a shift. Um, there can be wipes or alcohol and towels by the door and you wipe down the doorknobs, you immediately go to the sink and you wash your hands for 20 seconds. Um, you can even ask someone potentially to bring another change of clothes so that any clothes that may have been exposed to someone on their way in, they can put directly, ideally if you have a washing machine, put them straight in the washing machine um, or put them in a bag take them home again um, and wear a, a different change of clothes or put something on over. Um, and then 
washing your hands continually, right? Every time you do something, every time you go outside, if you take the trash out, you wash your hands again, you're probably doing that anyway, I hope. Um, and then at the end of the shift as well, right? To, to wash, to wipe down everything, to wipe down counters, to think about all the, the doorknobs and the other surfaces that people likely touch and to make sure those are as clean as possible. And so part of that means providing the basics, right? Lots of gloves, soap, hand sanitizer, um, wipes, you know, some of these things are, are things that I've tried not to because they're wasteful environmentally. Um, right now, you know, let's get those as much as possible. I know sometimes it's also an issue to even get these things that stores don't have them, or maybe you can't get out to get them because you don't want to be around people and expose yourself or the person that you're working for. Um, I do want to let people know there are a number of mutual aid networks that can help with it. Um, and DOS the, in San Francisco, the Department of Disability and Aging Services has set up um, a system for food and, and other deliveries through Shanti. I realize not everyone here is in the Bay Area. Um, if you are, we also, Senior and Disability Action has a mutual aid network. Um, I'll put that in the chat as we're talking. But um, if you're not, I would encourage you to Google and see if you can find a mutual aid network somewhere in your community or on Facebook um, and see if there's someone else who has some of these cleaning materials or can get them for you. So self-isolate as much as possible. Um, I really appreciate the comments about needing some workers to come in. That is so real. And so really being creative about um, about thinking about who needs to come in and who doesn't, right? Do you have someone who only does a couple shifts a week and is around a lot of other family members or works for other people? And maybe that's not a good person to be connected with. And ideally, maybe that is also someone who can afford to not, um, to not be working for you for a month or two. Um, or is that someone that you can continue to pay, but you decide that is someone that shouldn't come to work for the time being? You want to think about which are the things that have to get done and which are the things that can wait or get done a little less often. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't always confess this on a national call, but like many of us, I'm taking fewer showers these days, right? Because I'm not going out as much. And so that saves a lot of of time in terms of the help that I'm getting from my partner. Um, you know, maybe do do laundry a little less often, right? Thinking about um, cooking and ways to, to do a bunch at once and freeze some things. So really just being creative about how we can limit the time that, that we need. Um, and then limiting the time you spend with someone that is similar, right? If, um, if you have someone come in and help, are there some things that they can do from the next room to have a little bit of distance? Um, and interestingly, I, I, I've read the other day about the coronavirus that there is, there is something to how much of it you get from them, right? If you're sitting right next to someone for an hour versus if you're next to someone for a few moments while um, they help you get out of bed, but then they're in the next room, that that can mean a lesser, lesser form of, of the, um, the infection. So talking through the issues, this is always a critical one, is to just be really open and honest about this with people. Um, with, with this kind of work, because it is, it is hard to do, it is not talked about very much in society. Um, of course, it is generally not well paid. Um, many of us struggle to pay our workers as much as we know they deserve, and that's hard to do. Um, it's so important to, to just talk through all of this, right? To be open about the, the financial situation that everyone is dealing with. Um, we can also support our, our workers if they're not working for us right now to file for unemployment, to get help through the Coronavirus Care Fund through the National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, to look at what other resources are available to help them, and to talk with them about what can they do to self-isolate as much as possible so they are not exposing themselves to other people and you, you know, exposing you as well. Um, so sick pay, I've mentioned a couple times, definitely something ideally um, you are doing already. And so now it's the law in California to provide three sick days 
a year to um, attendants or caregivers. But, um, but really to think about if you are not paying someone else during that time, can you continue to pay them so that they can pay their own bills? Um, Self-isolate with a worker is definitely one option. If you have someone that you really trust, if you have a spare bed or maybe a comfortable couch, um, do you have someone who would be willing to stay with you and isolate with you for a few weeks? It's a big ask, but again, something to think about. And, you know, I just want to remind you that, that we all have to think about the power dynamics involved, um, that as an employer, we automatically have an imbalance of power. And so it's something that you want to acknowledge in those conversations and make sure people don't feel obligated to say yes, but to maybe raise something, give people time to think about it, let them bring it up and let you know what they feel comfortable with. Um, and then of course, take action if you're feeling sick for both the, the senior or person with a disability or family caregiver or worker, right? The second you're feeling sick um, to talk to the people around you. Um, you know, if a worker is feeling sick, you want them to go home immediately if they can or self-isolate even in another um, room in the house. Um, and make sure they know that, that they're not in trouble, that they will still get paid if you're paying them for that time. Um, and to, to make sure people get, get checked out if possible and that they, they are separated. So those are some of our key recommendations. Um, I think it really comes down to taking as many precautions as you can, doing a lot of communicating more than usual, um, being gentle and kind with each other about this is hard for all of us and we want to keep all of all of ourselves safe um, and being creative right asking the people that were around to be creative with us about let's make sure we're all in the best situation possible so I will stop there and turn it back over to Nikki uh, thanks Jessica um, Alvin, can you uh, change the slide um, so now I'm going to touch upon some of Hand in Hand's kind of general best practices for attendant employment. Um, and uh, these are relevant in the context of, uh, you know, COVID-19 and beyond. So um, Jessica talked a lot about um, good communication and clear expectations. Um, open communication and clear expectations is really the key to both uh, fair employment and really creating a positive and p productive re working relationship um, between uh, worker and employer. Um, in this crisis, it's extremely important to have conversations with your workers about what your expe expectations are in your working relationship to maintain safety for both of you. Um, you know, I had uh, con many conversations with my workers around hygiene requirements. Um, you know, so many of the things that uh, Jessica already um, already mentioned. Um, and sometimes I have those continue to have those conversations. It's not just one conversation. It's like uh, you know having those conversations you know over and over again as need be. You know, sometimes I have to. Uh, remind people to like wash your hands before they do a uh, the next task. Um, and, um, you know, good communication starts with hiring and the interview process. Um, I'm actually trying to enter, uh, hire someone, uh, a new worker right now. Um, and if you, you know, and one of the things that I'm doing is I'm doing the interviews over uh, phone and, and video. Um, and, um, and then once I do hire someone, and I recommend this, once you do hire someone to have a conversation before they come um, over uh, to your home for the first time about how you work together to keep each other safe um, and, um, you know, what your safety protocols that you have put in place and to make sure that um, they feel like they can follow, uh, you know, your safety protocols and that you just have a a real um, open conversation about about that. Um, you know, I think you know when you first meet someone, first impressions are are really important, and and they help get, you get a good sense of each other, um, communication style, and the chemistry be between you. 
you know, it's a little bit uh, like a, a first date when you hire someone. You, you, you know, uh, you're just kind of getting to know each other and making sure that you're a good, a good match. Um, when you hire someone, I recommend you have a written work agreement, uh, uh, which lays out the roles and responsibilities for you and, and the worker. And uh, we have some sample work agreements on the Hand in Hand uh, website uh, that you can take a look at. Um, and, you know, just take time to get to know someone, you know, have informal uh, conversations. Uh, you know, be sure to appreciate, you know, uh, the person that you're working with. Um, I like to remember that this is, this is an intimate relationship in many ways. It's not uncommon for an attendant to become like a family member. And, you know, they're taking care of you or your loved one. And, um, and so sometimes it can be challenging to bring up issues or concerns with a caregiver because, you know, you or they are fearful of dealing with uh, conflict in the relationship. Um, this is why I think some of the tips I just went over are so important to do, no matter what, there will always be conflict. And, um, and you know, a, a good rule of thumb that I always think about is to talk early and often and provide and invite feedback. And remember that <clears throat> your person that you're working with, that they are, are a person with, uh, with their unique needs and communication styles. And so, you know, it's just, it is a real relationship. You just have to really like uh, work with each other. Um, so there's a lot of issues um, that also come up around fair pay and paid time off. Um, and those can range, those uh, things can range from different parts of the country, parts of even parts of the state have different you know, like rules around like uh, minimum wage and wages. Um, you know, we at Hand in Hand recommend that you try and pay a living wage, uh, um, which, you know, depending on where you live, can be up to, you know, 15 to $20 an hour, or maybe even more in high cost areas. Um, you know, we, rec we, you know, we understand that that can be challenging, but these are just uh, recommendations. Um, and also that, uh, over time um, can be an issue. So you want to, uh, we recommend overtime after eight hours a day or 40 hours a week. And I believe in fact that the, that their legal, the law actually says, I think it's actually, uh, I might have to look that up. I think it's uh, uh, after nine hours a day. I'm not sure if you can help me with that, uh, Jessica, but. Yeah, I think it's nine hours a day, 45 hours a week. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so if you, can, if you can't afford to pay overtime, uh, we recommend you split of shifts. So a tenant doesn't have to work more than, you know, eight or nine hours in a day. So you might split it up into three shifts, three eight hour shifts, depending on how often you need someone. And um, know that many of us don't have control over pay because we're working through like IHSS or are using Medicaid for our other government programs. And, you know, it, what you can do if you don't control pay is you can advocate for higher wages and good benefits. Um, and, um, and we really hope that every, you can, uh, that everyone should have paid time off. So, uh, the state, uh, Jessica mentioned this er earlier, is that um, there's, I think it's like three hours, uh, three days of sick leave um, is required by the, the state. Uh, there's different laws, I think, in different um, states. Um, and then, you know, in this particular crisis that we're having, um, Hand in Hand recommends for providing at least 10 days or more of paid time off if you are able. Um, for so that your employee can visit the doctor if they're sick or stay home um, to care for themselves or their family members who are sick. Um, we like, to, uh, I think you want to think about making sure that you have, uh, that the person who's working for you has meals and rest breaks. Um, and you like, they can be, you know, in, uh, uh, 
on do they could be in your home and have a break and um and uh um and we recommend uh at least 30 minutes of lunch break and at least one 15 minute break every four hours. Um, you know, they're, they're working hard and they deserve uh, to have a break like any other type of worker. Um, if you hire someone to do overnight or, or you need some 24 hour care, we recommend um, eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. Um, and you know, if you can't afford to pay um, pay time off, you know, there's other ways to show your appreciation or make the job sustainable for your employees. Um, you know, every relationship is different. Um, communication is, you know, the most important thing. Um, you know, sometimes just it, appreciating your worker can go a long way to to make to really make it a really strong relationship. And, um, you know, understanding the needs of the people that you employ and, you know, making sure that they understand your needs also. Um, so now I think I'm going to turn it back um, over to Jessica. Calvin, I think we're a couple slides behind. And we'll send these out later. People will see those fair pay and paid time off. And if you can go one more, please. Thank you. So um, wanted to encourage people during this time and always to get support. And I know if you're um, connected with the Family Caregiver Alliance, um, they are all about making sure people have support. Wanted to share some of the, the support that people can get right now, um, both in terms of additional caregiving or home care um, and support for seniors and people with disabilities and family members. So um, I mentioned earlier, there's a number of mutual aid networks um, in the Bay Area. There's um, Senior and Disability Action and Bay Resistance. That's the, the link I put up earlier. The Disability Justice Culture Club has an excellent mutual aid network in the East Bay. And there are some networks around the country where people can fill in to provide home care or maybe to um, pick up a load of laundry and wash it or bring groceries. Things that don't require any contact are really great things to think about right now. Um, backup home care registries, I know, is something that a lot of um, public authorities are working on, um, and you can reach out if the, um, the worker that you generally have doesn't feel comfortable coming or is around a lot of other people. Maybe there's someone else um, who, who would reduce the exposure to you or to the person that you're caring for. Um, I already mentioned being creative about who can fill in, and, you know, in our society, many of us are not great about asking for help, and this is a good opportunity to practice that, that um, I really love seeing in a time like this, the way people step up and are so willing to help each other, and that I think particularly we see a lot of people feeling helpless, and to, to have something that they feel like they can do right now that really helps someone, um, people are often more than happy to do that. And so to think, is there a neighbor who, um, who you know, maybe lives alone or there's only a couple people there and maybe they could bring groceries or maybe they can even fill in um, as, a, as an attendant or a caregiver once or twice a week. Um, maybe there's a, an occupational therapist um, who you could get in touch with, who has some skills and you could bring in easily, right? Just being creative and not being afraid to ask. Clarifying urgent needs, I think I already mentioned. Um, and then social connection, right? That we have um, so many seniors and people with disabilities that um, we're, I mean, we're all isolated in lots of different ways, right? But seniors and people with disabilities and our family members, if we are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 and really limiting ourselves and not going out at all, that lack of social connection can be really hard. So um, in the Bay Area, and it recently expanded to all of California, we have the friendship line where people can call in and talk to someone. Um, through our mutual aid network, we also set up phone buddies, and that's something you can think about is having, um, setting up a, a partner where people can connect once a day or once a week and just to say hello. Um, through Senior Disability Action and lots of other organizations, there are book readings and films about issues of disability and aging and everything. 
Um, there are exercise classes. There are all kinds of different things um, that we can do online to just provide some extra support to all of us. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to say a word about policy responses. Um, there's a lot of really interesting policy conversations happening right now. Um, and I think it's really important for us to take this moment um, as an opportunity to really think about what do we want our world to look like beyond this pandemic, right? And that for anyone on this call, we know that the home care system in this country is deeply flawed, it has a lot of holes, it is very hard on everyone involved um, to make sure that we get what we need and that we can afford it. And so is this actually a time where we can raise some of those issues and that as sheltering in place or when it starts to end, not yet, um, but that we can then think about what do we do to make sure we have good services and supports in place? Um, so one is in terms of, of publicly funded home care, like in-home supportive services. Um, the state of Illinois is, oops, can you go back one piece? Is providing some flexibility in who can be a provider, right? Um, California has been pretty generous, but not every state is as far as can a spouse or a family member be a provider. Um, there are issues of whether um, family members can get unemployment, right? And we know that's especially important right now. Um, there are questions about overtime hours. How many overtime hours can you get? That if we're limiting the number of workers to reduce exposure, then people may need to be able to get more overtime. Um, there's also um, move to do phone reassessments, right? Instead of having social workers come into people's houses and exposing people, um, there's more of that happening on the phone. And some of these are things we may want to think about continuing beyond, right? I've definitely heard from people with disabilities who use IHSS who say, you know, my condition is so stable, it doesn't make sense for a social worker to spend their time when there are so many other people to be coming out and seeing what I'm doing, right? So can we think about continuing some of those things by phone? Um, sick leave has been a big one. Do we need to improve our sick leave system and figure out sick leave for, um, for private pay workers, for individually paid workers as well. Uh, wages, we know that's an ongoing issue, that we need to find ways to raise wages throughout the system and make it affordable for families. And again, we're really seeing that in this moment where so many people are really financially strapped. And then the concerns about congregate settings, right? So. Um, I'm assuming people are on this call because you are living in your own home or you want to keep your, your family member um, living in, in their home and in the community. Um, but when, when that's not available, right? When you can't make sure that the person gets the care they need and someone goes into a nursing home or into a group home, a board and care, um, we see so many illnesses and deaths from COVID-19 right now. And so, um, so are there ways that we can look at providing more support for individuals and families um, if people want to stay at home and if we think it's, it's safer in terms of pandemic for people to be at home? So that was a, a lot. <laughs> We're not going to um, go into a lot of that, but um, I will invite people to, to get involved with Hand in Hand and Senior and Disability Action and just kind of some food for thought about things that hopefully we can all explore beyond this moment. And I think Nikki will do the next slide. Okay, so, um, so there are many things that we and can all do. I mean, we're all really in this together and it's up to all of us to advocate for ourselves, um, our workers and our communities. Um, so here are some actions that, um, you know, we invite you um, to take with us. Um, you know, on an individual level, having a conversation with your employees, your workers to make a plan together to stay safe. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, but I can't underscore how important it is, is to have to have conversations with the people that are coming into your home and, you know, to continue having those conversations, you know, as often as you need to. Um, we have put together, Hand in Hand has uh, put together a coronavirus best practice advice um, um, 
for people who employ attendants. Um, and um, I think we can share the link to that. Um, I know we can share the link to that um, and if we can make sure that uh, it gets uh, put in the packet that gets mailed out to you, emailed out to you after this. Um, there's also a, a pledge you can take uh, for those who can continue to um, pay your employees through this uh, uh, public health crisis. There's a, a pledge that we um, we made up for people to say that they will continue to pay their employees. Um, and just think about what uh, which of these um, precautions you can maintain long term. Um, I think it's important that we we all learn from this pandemic. It's like you know I've learned so many things already, um, and that we just continue to learn and to um, really uh, take action together. Um, so you can find um, more information on the Hand in Hand website. Um, that's at www.domesticemployers.org. And um, we'll make sure that you get that information um, emailed out to you. Um, another thing that's happening is that um, Hand in Hand is, uh, is holding weekly calls with, um, with uh, uh, at people who employ attendants. Uh, and I'm going to put the... Um, uh, you should contact uh, Lindsay at, actually, I just put it in the chat. So uh, <laughs> um, Lindsay um, is the organizer for the uh, uh, California Hand in Hand um, chapter. And she, uh, uh, actually, she and I have been um, facilitating calls um, every Friday um, afternoon for anyone who has an issue or just wants to have us contact with other people that employ attendants and and just the time for us to get together once a week and kind of share what's going on with each of us it's part social and also really informative and then we often will bring uh issues or problems that we're having and kind of we can all kind of talk it out with each other and give each other um advice about um issues so um i'm going to pass it back to jessica now all right, next slide, please. Thanks, Nikki. So um, as far as taking action at the community level, um, we wanna invite you to support any of the mutual aid efforts in your neighborhood or contribute to the Coronavirus Care Fund, um, which is at um, www.domesticworkers.org. Um, at the policy level, um, there's a number of things we wanna invite you to get involved in. Um, one is to work on policies to support attendants and attendant employers. Um, I mentioned things like wages and sick leave. Um, in California and across the country, there is work to get universal long-term services and supports, um, particularly to think about when a crisis like this happens so that we have more resources. You know, the way we're all just kind of like barely managing to, to get and provide the care makes it very hard when something like this hits. And so to have universal care to make sure um, things are affordable is really critical. And then we are working on a campaign um, to stop policies that ration care. People may have heard about this issue where states are setting triage guidelines if there are not enough hospital beds or not enough ventilators um, where they are deciding who gets care. And we are fighting against the idea that seniors and people with disabilities shouldn't get care because they have fewer years left to live. That is usually the way it is phrased. Um, and there have been some, some really blatant comments about um, people being not as valuable, that um, the idea that we should just kind of let people uh, let people die if they're going to die from this. And so it's incredibly important for us to name that as the ableism and ageism that it is and to come together to fight back. So Senior and Disability Action um, has a lot of ways to do that. And of course my notes disappeared, right? As I was about to give you a couple of those. Uh, give me one moment. Um, okay, so you can connect with our coalition in California or look for organizations, disability organizations primarily um, are working on this that are near you. Um, if you're on social media, please connect with um, Senior and Disability Action on social media and you can see some of the news articles and um, 
and calls to action that we'll post about care rationing or when you see articles in your local um, media or national media about this, please post them. Make sure people understand what's going on and that we see this as, as harmful as it is. And, and to share stories about yourself or about the, the older people or the disabled people in your life and that these lives are worth saving, obviously. Um, if you're a writer, if you wanna do an op-ed in your local paper, that's great as well. We're also doing ableism and ageism trainings um, to talk about the history and what is ableism and how do we talk about it. Um, and so if you're interested in doing a, a virtual training, um, again, get in touch with us about that. Along with rationing care, we are also working hard to protect people in nursing homes and other care facilities. I'm sure people have seen the um, the horrible stories about how so many deaths right now are in these care facilities and often um, it's because um, workers don't have the safeguards in place that they need and they're getting sick as well um, that some have had problems with infection control in the past so there's a lot of work to be done in the short and long term and i invite you all to be part of that um, I actually made up, I think that's our last slide. Is that our last slide, Calvin? We just have a closing slide. There we go, thank you. So um, there is my information, um, Jessica Lehman for Senior and Disability Action. And then for Hand in Hand, um, you can email info at domesticemployers.org. Um, and there are both websites. And then, um, so I just made a quick um, form that I'm going to paste here that I wanna invite you to fill out. And this is both um, a, a short evaluation on our training today, um, as well as inviting you to include your name and email if you want to get involved or want some follow-up resources. Um, so please take a moment, um, there's, I can't remember, less than 10 questions. It should only take you a moment, so please do that. Um, and at this point, we can open it up for questions and comments. Perfect, thanks so much, uh, Jessica and Nikki. We do have uh, a little bit of time for questions, so I'll get right into it. We have one listener who wanted to know, is there, I guess, any difference specifically in this um, time of COVID-19 um, in terms of hiring someone from a company or using an independent uh, or kind of a self-employed care attendant, a paid caregiver, uh, what might be the differences in those two types of um, employees in terms of specifically now with COVID-19? It's a great question. Nikki, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Sure, I can, uh, I can, I can talk about that and feel free to add more onto it. Um, I think, you know, um, I generally am a, a self-employ my attendance. Uh, and like I, I talked about earlier, um, you know, I'm being really careful with, uh, with how I do the interviews over the phone and having discussions with people um, about my safety uh, protocols. Um, I, I'm imagining that um, organizations are doing similar things. Um, it, uh, it, um, I don't know that there's uh, I think that there is a difference between self-employing someone and also going through an agency. Um, um, I think with agencies, sometimes you end up having to pay a little bit more because they have uh, overhead costs that they uh, pass on to the consumer. Um, but um, I don't know too much about how agencies are employing people right now. I don't know if Jessica, you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I'm sorry. I was, while I let you answer that, Nikki, I was responding to some comments in the chat. So I don't think I have anything to add. Perfect. Uh, another listener wanted to know about, uh, verbatim, what laws protect family caregivers? Or, um, and so they're, you know, they're asking what, what laws might protect someone who's hiring a paid attendant. Maybe you could also ask the same question that what are some of the legal things that people who are hiring um, hiring paid attendants, um, paid family caregivers, what are some of the legal considerations they should keep in mind, especially now that there is um, some bit of risk for people coming to their workplace providing care? Um, 
Um, That's a really difficult question. I'll let you. I know. I was like, hoping Nikki wanted to take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I actually am not a legal expert on um, attendant, uh, hiring attendants. I do know that, um, that, uh, you know, attendants are, uh, that there are overtime laws um, that are in place and the sick leave laws that are in place, but I'm not sure if there's any, any other legal um i mean the one thing i would say is that i do recommend that you do a work uh you write, write up a work agreement if uh with your uh, with your uh worker and it's it's not necessarily they're not necessarily legally binding but i think it really helps um to clarify a lot of issues particularly around pay and schedules and that it just is it is when people uh, have a document that they have to sign, they're probably just going to be paying a, a lot more attention to the to the relationship. Anything else you want to add to that, Jessica? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you asked about protections for workers because it's it's such a problem that, um, as Nikki mentioned, in the history of domestic work, right? Domestic workers often haven't been eligible for protections that that most other workers have. And even when they are supposed to get protections because the work is so private in individual homes. And let's be honest, for so many of us as employers, including myself, we're just trying to figure out what we're doing, right? And I have certainly made mistakes and, and unintentionally broken the law, right? Um, and so there's so much potential for workers not to be, um, not to have the rights that they should. So it was just a few years ago that a national um, regulation was changed so that all workers do get minimum wage and overtime. And minimum wage is actually an issue where some people um, may pay a set amount for a shift and then ask the person to, you know, oh, can you do this one more thing? And pretty soon the person is getting paid far less per hour than, than they are supposed to. Um, workers are supposed to get workers comp and unemployment. Um, there's definitely questions about whether people get paid on the books or off the books. And the advantage of being on the books is then people can get unemployment and they have Medicare and Social Security paid into. Um, but of course, there are a lot of reasons that that people um, may not want to or may not be able to if they are undocumented, if they, um, you know, it's it's kind of a, a way of often non-traditional work that, that people can do where they can't do other work. Um, so that's a little bit about it. And then I would encourage people to contact the National Domestic Workers Alliance for more information about specific um, legal protections and particularly for workers who need to talk to someone about how to exercise their rights, that there are a lot of good resources out there for that. Perfect. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I have another, um, the two questions I guess are linked. I kind of know what they're getting at. Um, one's a little bit more explicit. One of them wanted to know um, uh, how you would um, get a paid attendant tested for COVID-19. And the other related question is, um, how can you make sure um, that a paid attendant uh, is not infected with COVID-19? So um, this is a very, there's no easy answer on this, um, particularly since this is a national call and there is no standard right now of testing. In some places people can get on-demand testing, in many, many places people cannot. Um, this also is a policy issue as far as essential workers, um, including healthcare workers, are often the one of the only groups that can get tested. And in some places that includes home care workers and in some places it does not. Um, and so that's something to look into is to call your local health department and find out if attendants and caregivers um, are included and if not to let them know that you think they should be. Um, I'm sorry, was there a second part of that question that I missed? Sure. Well, the other, um, the other question was, um, and actually, I, I believe I know the answer to this one, but um, I'll ask you the expert. The person wanted to know how you can be sure that a paid attendant is not a, does not have the coronavirus, COVID-19. Mm. Did you want to go ahead, Calvin? Um, no, I mean, I was going to give a, a very short answer that there's not really any, you know, it's very hard to be, you know, 100% sure. And, you know, the, the moment you could get tested, you, you know, maybe you, you catch it on the way back from the test. But um, 
I was wondering if you had any. Um... Exactly. I would say the same thing. Um, somebody did post, can you ask home care workers to take their temperature when they come in? And I said, and, you know, I recognize, again, Nikki and I are not lawyers. I could be wrong about this, but I believe the answer is yes, if you ask everyone, right, so that you're not deciding who to test. And you have to provide the thermometers and make sure that um, that people are safe. But I mean, yeah, if you want to test people's temperature, you could certainly ask people before they come in every time, have you had any of these symptoms? There's no, um, there's no hundred percent, but that's, that's what I would say. Um, I just wanted to add um, one thing on to the last uh, question. So I was on a call with uh, Senator Kamala Harris last Friday, um, last week, and she, um, I know she's working um, with a couple other legislators to introduce a bill to make um, home care workers part of the essential worker uh, uh, as a to be, designate them as essential workers. So I think um, in that that you could probably send her an email, write letters to her, really encouraging her to really uh, follow through with uh, with. Um, uh, putting a bill in place to work on this as another thing, another form of action that you can take. Perfect. I have um, one last listener question, which um, it may be more of a policy question, but it, it probably might be interesting to ask since um, I know Jessica, at least that you are, um, you know, an advocate for um, these paid attendants. Also, you're a employer of them. What are your thoughts on these kind of robots or uh, mechanical caregivers, robot caregivers, I guess is what you might call them, especially now that people are worried that with a, um, many of the um, paid attendants, that there's a worry that maybe they had been exposed to um, a COVID-19 or some other kind of um, illness? <laughs> oh, that's a funny question. Um, I mean, in general, I am not a fan. I think um, in general, I think robots taking jobs from people is not a great plan for our society, to be honest. I think with with care work, to try to do that without the personal interaction um, does not seem very workable. And I think um, when we're talking about all of us who need some form of care or assistance, that it's also the human interaction that is so valuable. And to take that away in this time of isolation um, seems really harmful. So I understand it could be safer than being exposed to people, but I think if, if you could have somebody do it um, who is in person, but to minimize the exposure, that would be the ideal in my head. Perfect, thank you so much. I think that is just about all the time we have for questions. But before we go, um, I was wondering if there may be one or two things you'd like um, both Jessica and Nikki, if you'd like um, listeners to remember or kind of take home with them from today's presentation, um, what would those one or two or three things, what might those be? You want to start, Nikki? Sure. <clears throat> sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's just really important to remember that, um, that people that you employ in your home are, you know, they have their own, um, you know, issues and families and, you know, lots of things going on in their lives and that, you know, it's a, it is a real relationship and that we um, honor them as much as we honor ourselves and that we, you know, we really uh, treat them like, uh, like they're, like they're people and have their own needs and responsibilities. Um, and I think the other, only, just the other thing I would say is that, you know, it, this is a this is a tough time, and that we just we just have to be really creative and think um, kind of outside the box and how we get our needs met and the needs of our workers met. Um, and this is Jessica. Um, I want to add a couple things. One is a reminder: if you haven't filled out the the short evaluation follow up form, please do that now. Um, so um, there were also a couple questions. There was one about. Um, if somebody is in a group home, should you um, should you have them stay there or should you have them at home if possible? And 
you know, this is a hard one, I would say in terms of safety, because there is so much COVID-19 spreading through congregate settings. If you can keep that person at home, then I think that is ideal. Um, but I know that can be hard. And so I think also to, to really reach out for support to friends and family members and neighbors and to not be afraid to do that, to say, you know, hey, I want this person to be at home so they're safer, but could you do our groceries, our grocery shopping once every week or two? Or could you, um, could you come in and, you know, if the person needs, needs some kind of companionship or supervision, could you do that a couple hours a week um, to not be afraid to ask for that? Um, and then, oh, there was a question about keeping safe. We did include some of that earlier on, and that'll be in the follow-up materials. And I think just beyond that is to remind everyone to take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Um, we will get through this. Let's think about how we can um, come through this with, with even better ideas about how to build a really good system of care for all of us. And um, you know, the old expression, the personal is political. I think we're really seeing that here is that while you are dealing with issues in your own home or with your own family members, that um, we need to bring this out in the open and that this does connect with how seniors and people with disabilities and workers um, are seen and treated and that there's a lot we can do in the community to create the kind of society we want. So hey, um, thank you to everyone for being part of this today and I look forward to working with some of you more on that. Thank you. Thanks everyone again. Um, that's all we have the time for today. I'd like to uh Mayor Jessica's thoughts. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, spending um spending an hour with us. Thank you to our presenters, uh Jessica Lehman and Nikki Booker. Thank you. Please take care, everyone. Be safe and have a good afternoon. Calvin, let me just say yes. oops, are people yeah. gone? Somebody said they need the link again. If people are still there, if we can just keep this line open. Oops. I'm going to share that link one more time sure. in the chat. Sure, I will keep it open, but um, otherwise, um, thank you all again for attending, and we'll see you on the next one.